Welcome guys to our fourth review session for the SOL. Today we're going to be talking about biochemistry. So what's the first thing we're going to do? So the first thing we're going to do is talk about water. So water is the most abundant molecule in our bodies. Most of our bodies and most of all living things are composed of water. That's right. And the reason why we're not using a percentage here is because the percentage varies. It depends on what textbook you're reading. Right. So let's move on to point A. The chemical formula of water is? H2O. All right. So what does that mean? It means that there is one oxygen atom in water, but two hydrogen atoms. Okay. And water is a? Polar molecule. All right. And what does that mean? Um, it means that water has opposite charges on both ends. So, and so if we were to draw a water molecule, mm -hmm. so I'm going to draw it right here. Looks like Mickey Mouse. There, I'm going to do mine down. upside down, okay. right? So here are my hydrogens. Mm -hmm. If it's polar, it just means that it's like the Earth. It has poles, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a positive side mm -hmm. with our hydrogens and a negative side. So they're just oppositely charged. All right. Water has some very unique properties as well. And these unique properties allow water to be leveraged in unique ways on our planet and in our body. So let's look at the first one. So the first is that water is less dense as a solid than a liquid. So what does that mean? So solid water is ice. So mm -hmm. basically what this means is that ice floats on water. And that's going to be really important for living things that need to walk and live on that ice or for the fish that need to be able to stay alive underneath the ice during the winter. Yeah, so water freezes from the top down, not from the bottom up, so it doesn't kill anything in the process. Right. All right, let's look at the next unique property. Water has a very high boiling point. And basically what that means is it's pretty hard to boil water. you got to make that water really hot. And this is important when you think about our planet because our planet is mostly water. If it had a low boiling point, if we had a hot day, the oceans would be boiling. <laughs> That's right. So, And sometimes on the test, instead of saying that it has a high boiling point, it'll say that it has a high specific heat, which means the same thing. And because it has a high specific heat, we can actually use water to regulate the temperature. So if you think about like coastal regions, their temperatures don't really fluctuate that often like they do here in central Virginia. Virginia. We can have an 80 degree day and mm -hmm. then we can have a 45 degree day because we don't have a large body of water that's helping to um, absorb the extra energy or the extra heat in the surrounding so our temperatures can fluctuate. Right and, and in our bodies too we said we're mostly composed of water so water actually helps us maintain homeostasis Excellent. and helps us keep a constant temperature. All right let's look at the last unique property of water. So water is a universal solvent. So what does that mean? That's actually probably one of the most important things that the SOL is going to you about. Mm -hmm. So you know what? I'm going to put a big star here because we know that we're going to see that again. That basically means because water is polar, it mm -hmm. has opposite charges on opposite ends, water can break things up. So uh. things can dissolve into water. So if you think about Kool-Aid, for instance, Kool-Aid powder can dissolve into water because water is a universal solvent. It breaks it up. There are some things, though, that cannot be dissolved by water. Right. And those are things that are not like water, that are not polar. They're nonpolar. Right. So when we talk about some nonpolar molecules before, we want to remember that those don't really dissolve in water. And you've probably seen this if you've ever tried to mix oil and water. Oil is nonpolar, and, and the two won't mix. So the next concept that we're going to talk about is pH or the pH mm -hmm. scale. So let's talk about what the pH scale is. Okay, so the pH scale runs from 0 to 14 and basically it's a measure of how acidic or basic a substance is. So let's go ahead and, and label the scale we have at the bottom. So that's a question that we always want to remember. How mm -hmm. acidic or basic is something? So we're going to put 0 on one end and 14 in the other and exactly in the middle we have 7. So we can start off talking about 7. Since 7 is right in the middle, we say that a substance with a pH of 7 is neutral. And there's actually only one substance that is, has a truly neutral pH, and that is pure water, distilled water. Okay. And what about the space down here? So things less than 7 are acidic. Those are where you're going to find your acids. And the lower the number, the farther away from 7, the more acidic it is. So something with a pH of 1, for instance, is much more acidic, a stronger acid than something with a pH of 6. That's good to know. All right, and what about if we move in the opposite direction, positively away from 7? So everything with a pH above 7 is a base or basic. And again, the farther away you are from 7, the stronger the base. So something with a pH of 8 is a little bit 
acidic, but or a little bit basic, but not really. Something with a pH of 13 is going to be very basic. And just so that you guys aren't confused, sometimes we use a different word than basic on the mm -hmm. SOL. Sometimes we'll use a word that looks like this. Alkaline. But it means the same thing. Right. So either term, you need to be comfortable with it because you know you're going to see it on your SOL. So now we're going to talk about macromolecules, which are very large molecules. Another name you'll sometimes see for macromolecule is polymer. Poly meaning many because they're made of lots of things. And the things that they're made of, the building blocks, are called monomers. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write building block over here. And, and there's, these guys are small, right? Right. And there's four different types of macromolecules you need to know for the SOL. So let's go ahead and start talking about carbohydrates. So the easiest way to remember what the monomer is for a carbohydrate is just to remember what we told you. Longest word, because this is the longest one on the list. Mm -hmm. Longest word goes to the longest word. And that long word, which is the carbohydrates monomer, is monosaccharide. So carbohydrates are made up of lots of monosaccharides. All right. And then what about lipids? Lipids. So that's the easiest one to remember. Don't put your lipids Don't. on my fatty acids. So the monomer of lipids on my And then I'm going to change acids. the color to highlight this. Fatty acids. Excellent. All right, how about proteins? So for proteins, you want to remember pro-amino. And that's because proteins are made up of amino acids. All right, and then what's our last one? Nucleic acids is probably the easiest to remember because the two words sound very similar. You can just remember N with N. So nucleic acids, the monomer is nucleotides. And we've talked about nucleotides mm -hmm. on a previous video. Remember that nucleotides are the circle, which mm -hmm. is the phosphate next to the house, which is the sugar, and then our nitrogen base. So it right. looks just like that guy. All right, so let's talk about some functions now. Okay, so some things that carbohydrates are important for are carbohydrates are really the main energy source for living things. When your that body nice needs big. energy, especially quickly, it wants carbohydrates. Okay, and why don't we just go ahead and do the example for that guy. Okay, so the main carbohydrate, a very famous one that we should all know about, is glucose. Glucose, remember, is the sugar that's made in photosynthesis, and it's also the one that our mitochondria break down in order to make ATP energy. Okay. Um, now lipids. So lipids, so there's a couple different functions. One is for energy storage. So if an organism needs to store energy for a long period of time, maybe it's going to hibernate in the winter and need some stored energy. It might store it as fats, as lipids. Um, another thing lipids are used for is insulation. They help keep organisms warm and they help protect their organs and things that are on the inside. Yeah. And then some examples. So fats and oils are your lipids. So we have fats, oils, and I'm just going to throw in one more thing. I'm going to say waxes because right. you never know what's going to show up on the SOL. All of these things, something to remember, these are all nonpolar because that's going to show up again. Right. All right, and proteins. So proteins, the most important function of protein is that they are enzymes, which we're going to talk about more in a sec. So they speed up chemical reactions. They are the catalysts in our body. They kind of run the show. That's right. Speed of chemical reactions, and then just a minor thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to look at any living thing on the planet, right. if you're looking at Miss Hines and myself right mm -hmm. now, um, basically what you're seeing is a big pile of proteins. Right, that, it makes up the structure of living things too. So for example, there's a protein that makes up your hair, there's proteins that make up your skin. Um, all okay. of those are proteins. Um, so let's talk about the example for this particular function, because this is the big mm -hmm. one. So what's an example for something that speeds up chemical reactions? Let's just put enzyme. So if we see anything that's an enzyme, we'll know it's a protein. Okay. And then our last one is nucleic acid. So nucleic acids um, are involved with heredity, with the passing on of information from one generation to the next. So anything about heredity or genes, that's going to be your nucleic acids. Okay. And there are only two examples. Right. There's DNA, which is a big fat molecule, and then DNA skinny cousin, RNA. RNA. All right, our last section for biochemistry are enzymes. enzymes. Okay, so enzymes are biological catalysts. 
And a catalyst is just anything that speeds up stuff. And that's really important. So I'm going to underline that. You guys should do the same thing. And enzymes speed up something in particular, right? They speed up chemical reactions. So everything you're doing right now, thinking, breathing, writing, involves chemical reactions. And so enzymes are helping to make that happen. But enzymes just don't speed up everything. They right. only can speed things up if they're the right shape. So enzymes are shape. Specific. specific. That's really important. So they only catalyze reactants that fit inside of their active site. So we might want to pause here and draw a picture of what an enzyme looks like. Okay, so I'm going to draw my enzyme down here. You need to draw something similar to it on your paper. So this is my enzyme. And an enzyme has one part that's really, 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 mm -hmm. really important. And what is that part called? That part's called the active site. So it's going to be this part right here. So this is my active site. And my active site has to be a specific shape mm -hmm. because there's something else that's going to come around and has to sit in this same spot. Right. And that thing that has to sit there is the molecule that the, the enzyme is going to help react with. And that molecule is called a substrate. So those are all the parts. And because it's shape specific and it mm -hmm. can only speed up certain chemical reactions, we like to say that it works like a lock and key. All right. Kind of looks like a puzzle. So a lock and key. And anything that might mess up that shape, like if you change the temperature or the pH, if we mess up the shape, is our enzyme going to work? Nope. So my heat, or so the amount of heat or mm -hmm. the pH level, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. can change the shape. And if it changes the shape, it basically means it turns it off. Right. And then another word that means the same thing, because it's science class and yeah. you know there's lots of different words, we can even use the word denature. Mm -hmm. And I know that you guys have heard that before and hopefully remember it well. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that we know about enzymes in general, mm -hmm. let's apply what we know to a graph because we okay. know that the SOL loves graphs. Mm -hmm. So the way enzymes work is they speed up chemical reactions by lowering something called activation energy. And you want to think of activation energy as the speed bump of a chemical reaction. So we'll take a look at it in our graph. And um, in order to understand that, let's just talk about what speed bumps do. Yeah. So speed bumps, right? Um, they're there to help slow cars down. And they come in different sizes. Some speed bumps are smaller and some are larger. So you want to think about which kind of speed bump can you drive faster over, one that is small or one that is really big? All right, so then we can apply that concept to a graph. So here we go. We have two lines. We have a blue line and we have a red line. Right. Let's look at the blue line first because it looks like to me that that speed bump is substantially larger than the red one. Right, that's a really large speed bump. So if I was driving in my car over this speed bump, I would have to slow way down in order to not mess up my car. So this blue line is going to represent a very slow reaction, one with a very high activ activation energy, a very big speed bump. So a high activation energy that's important mm -hmm. and if there's a high activation energy and it's very slow do we have an enzyme present nope there is no enzyme and so because there's no enzyme we say that that reaction is uncatalyzed there's no catalyst okay now let's look at the other line mm -hmm. um, it's substantially smaller so right. what do we know about this guy so we know that this is a much shorter speed bump if I was driving in my car I could go over this a little bit faster so this reaction is gonna happen fast it has a low activation energy. And because of that, we know that this reaction had an enzyme. And so we say it's catalyzed. So all of those things apply. And just so everybody knows what we're talking about, mm -hmm. our activation energy is represented by the EA on this graph. So here we go. So it's basically the spot from here to here. Mm -hmm. So this is our first activation energy for the first chemical reaction. Here's our second one. What's important to note is that these chemical reactions are actually representing uh, reactants turning into products. Mm -hmm. And it's the same exact chemical reaction. Yeah. The only difference is what, Ms. Hines? The only difference is the activation energy, whether or not there's an enzyme and how fast it's going to happen. Yeah, so the only difference really is the time. Yep. 